So while I wait, since there's no one in here yet, I'm going to just start talking about random tether things that they'll be included in this video when I share it after this Q&A is over. Um, did you guys know Brock Pierce was arrested in Spain with Mark Collins Rector in a house full of child pornography? It's true, Tether was founded by a guy arrested in a house full of child pornography. That's not an answer to any specific questions, but if you have any specific questions, feel to ask them. Feel free to ask them. Bitfinex was founded by Rafael Nicolay. He was a help desk technician by day and a Ponzi schemer by night. Going through Bitcoin talk, trying to find the best opportunities to earn insane yields and then defending those Ponzi's even after they defaulted. That's who Bitfinex was founded by. Did you know that in the summer of 2018, Bitfinex started raiding Tether's reserves in order to cover up their own insolvency? Despite this fact, Tether's terms of service and website were not updated until February of 2019. Tether's insolvency started way before their disclosure to the public started. Crypto Capital Core was, besides a money laundering business, was run by embezzlers who kept two sets of books, one which was called the Master U.S. Workbook that contained the actual values. Investigators, when they compared this to the published values, saw that the principles of Crypto Capital Core were skimming about 10% off the top for all their clients. Generally, in corporate finance, it's considered in poor taste to commingle client and corporate funds. You're meant to keep your client funds and your corporate funds separate. Tether commingled their client and corporate funds and also commingled their client and corporate funds with Bitfinex's client and corporate funds and then commingled those funds with the rest of the clients of Crypto Capital Corp. It was a real mess over there. If anyone has anyone has any actual questions, please put them in the chat. Otherwise, I'm just going to spend the next few minutes doing Bitfinex and Tether fun facts. They're fun for me. They're less fun for Bitfinex and Tether. Did you know that every single day for the last several years, Tether has lied on their transparency page? They list a certain amount of frozen tethers, yet this number does not at all match up with what you can find on the blockchain. It is unclear why they do this. Perhaps their financial records are so bad they can't tell. Perhaps they just don't care. Neither one is particularly comforting to me. Feel free to throw any questions in the chat, by the way, y'all. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep ranting and raving. Like, there's so much stuff in the history of Bitfinex and Tether that I often just... It's a lot to pause and reflect on even for a moment. Like, there was a consultant early in uh, Bitfinex's history who went by the username myself, who helped them update the Bitcoinica code they had stolen. And like he described in Bitcoin talk about how Juan Carlo allegedly was crediting people's accounts with funds they didn't have and stuff like that. And like, that's a story I don't talk about very much because it's hard to get any like secondary sourcing on it. And it's certainly not like Bitfinex or Tether is going to ever confirm that they were fraudulently giving uh, their clients extra money. Anyone got any questions? Let's talk about the 2016 Bitfinex hack. After this, they did a 36% haircut. They said this haircut was the smallest, was the smallest they could do that. They were committing as much of their funds as possible. Nathaniel Popper, the New York Times reporter, when he was investigating the uh, 2016 Bitfinex hack, realized that uh, Coinbase seemed to have threatened to sue Bitfinex, and as such, were not included in the haircut. Thus, if you got a haircut from the 2016 Bitfinex hack, it was bigger than it was supposed to be, and it's Coinbase's fault. Other random things I can talk about about Bitfinex and Tether. In 2015, the Bitfinex hot wallet was hacked. What do I think about the chances of Stu's blog post about Tether's reserve quality being factual?
I think there is probably a way to interpret everything Stu said as the truth. Often when Bitfinex or Tether will make a statement, they are implying one thing and actually saying another. So like, you'll notice that in the paper, Stu doesn't describe, or in Stu's blog post, that is, he doesn't describe their commercial paper as being rated A2 or above. What he says is the vast majority of our papers from A2 and above rated issuers. So that means the paper itself could be um, different. Also, just more broadly than that, the fact that the vast majority comes from any selects that lever, that specific level, makes me wonder if a large portion of the commercial paper is coming from one or just a couple of different entities, and that it's because of that that they're able to make this statement about the vast majority being coming from issuers who are A2 and above, or whatever he said. The other part is we don't know who's doing that rating. So um, was it Moody's? Was it Standard & Poor's? Was it more Cayman? Those seem different and meaningfully so to me. Um, so yeah, my guess is there's probably a sense in which it's true, but I imagine it's not the full truth and nothing but the truth. Now, to be clear though, Bitfinex is totally okay with like outright lying. Like back in October of 2018, they published that blog post where they talked about how withdrawals were still totally working fine. And meanwhile, Juan Carlo was hopping on Skype to desperately message uh, Oz Yosef. And because of that, uh, because they couldn't do withdrawals, because they had no access to any of the funds at Crypto Capital Corp. So it is totally normal for Bitfinex or Tether to go out in public and make a bald-faced lie. My intuition is more just that there might be some amount of truth to what Stu's saying. And then I say that, and I catch myself because I go, then why did Stu put it up on his personal Medium page? Why didn't they use the Tether blog or like any of the other platforms directly associated with the business to make this clear? Why is it being shared just on this one Medium post? And I don't have any answer to that. It seems a little weird, frankly. Yeah, and like I said before, uh, Tether is actively lying on their transparency page. And this could be either rooted in poor financial records, right? Or in just them not caring to maintain that kind of public facing record. So that makes you then wonder about things like Stu's statement about their reserves or other statements about their reserve quality that are in large part based on management statements, like either to more Cayman or to whoever's doing the attestation. If it's largely based on that, and we're talking about a management that can't even keep track of the number of tethers they have frozen, it makes you wonder how careful and fastidious the rest of their bookkeeping might be. Um... Other random things I know about Bitfinex and Tether that a lot of people don't, let me think. So Junior Cole asked, do you know why USDC has a third of Tether's market cap but is way less volume if USDC is legit? Well, I think that's largely because, um, so Tether was the first stable coin or the first at least broadly integrated stablecoin. And so it has served this role in the marketplace that allows a whole bunch of these white label and offshore exchanges to spin up really easily because they don't need to find fiat banking. They don't need to find any of these things. They can just rely on Tether. These exchanges are often just outright fraudulent. And part of that is they'll just blatantly wash trade their pairs, right? Uh, to try to get their volume up. And for a while, even this was part of their marketing strategy. If your volume gets high enough, you'll show up like on the coin market cap page under markets, and then you might get some new legitimate interest in your exchange. So Tether's volume is so extraordinarily large because it is uh, often used by these exchanges who just flat out lie about their volume. And so the Tether volumes you'll hear quoted, like if you just take the naive numbers off CoinLib or something, will be like 70 to 80%. Tether's actual real volume across the industry is significantly smaller than that. I would say probably less than half of the real total volume. Um, USDC, because it is not as commonly used by those exchanges, doesn't see the same degree of wash trading. Further compounding this, we have the increase in usage of DeFi 
over the last couple of years. USDC is, I would say, more broadly accepted across DeFi protocols than USDT is, and often with more favorable risk parameters. So if you're looking at something like MakerDAO, it's going to be cheaper to mint DAI with USDC than with Tether. So someone who primarily intends to interact with DeFi instead of these centralized exchanges will be more incentivized to use USDC. But some of those protocols, the way they're doing, are not going to be reporting their volume in the same way that the centralized exchanges are. And so because of that, the apparent volume of USDC might be lower. There could be other reasons, but those are the first couple that spring to my mind. So Tulpar asks, Tether survived 2018 bear market, but they were much smaller. If they're not legit, they can't survive next bear market due to size. Would you agree? Fundamentally, this comes down to who has Tethers and how likely are they to redeem? And then how quickly would they redeem? So there's a couple different potential problems with Tether. One would be like regulatory intervention shuts down Tether and that immediately shuts down Tether. The other potential risk uh, would be more of like a classic money market fund risk, where due to changes in the underlying reserves or a large amount of redemptions, you start to see liquidity issues where the fund isn't able to pay out all the people trying to withdraw. So if we were to see a whole bunch of people trying to redeem Tether at once and they burn through their little bit of cash backing and having to start to liquidate other assets, then you may see difficulties in a bear market. Complicating this, Tether doesn't seem to go down very often. Uh, we saw a few redemptions during 2018 and stuff like that, but it's not super common for traders to redeem their Tether. And even if they did redeem their Tether, and we end up in the situation I was talking about before, where you have the uh, liquidity issues, right? Tether reserves in their terms of service the ability to not give you dollars. They can give you the commercial paper. They can give you anything else in their reserves and say, yeah, that's redeemed. And so things like that would shake the faith in USDT a lot, but they could still do that. So they're not necessarily the ones holding the bag in the case that everyone starts trying to redeem Tether. It's the Tether holders who get screwed uh, Grant Gullifson asks, any idea why Tether typically does large round number billion dollar prints? Um, so Stu and Paulo talked about this a little bit on Peter's podcast, and their claim is that they use the Tether treasury as a bit of like a buffer. They anticipate approximately how many Tethers are going to be needed, right? And print about that many and then issue them from the treasury as they're needed by the clients, the customers, the traders. This, they're the only major stable coin I know that uses this model. Uh, it's unclear why they use this model. The best explanation I can come up with is on some of these blockchains, the issuing address is perhaps multi-sig and requires several of the executives to coordinate to issue the tethers, but uh, actually sending them out might be single sig. So like perhaps it requires Paulo, Juan Carlo, and someone else to issue the tethers, but only requires Paulo or someone to send them out. And so by doing this, they can make it a little bit easier to issue new tethers into the market. Largely, I think it's just a way to misdirect. It makes it a little bit harder to actually track uh, tether prints, tether movements, tether issuances, stuff like that. So I think it's just another way to obscure some of what's really happening here. Uh, Tulpar says, redeeming is unimportant, all that matters is PEG. Sure, maybe, but um, the PEG is likely being supported by some amount of redemptions. There's likely someone, I mean, we've got groups like Alameda who claim they're able to redeem and do arbitrage against that PEG. So presumably, they're, my assumption is that they're not lying, that there are individuals who help maintain that peg because they have in the past been able to redeem. So long as they're still able to redeem, they'll continue to arbitrage against that peg and keep it at peg. So the peg may be what matters, but what helps maintain the peg is redemptions, is some place where you can confidently get a dollar for your tether. 
Grant says, after USDC did their $6 billion print, I noticed they started doing a few hundred million every few days. Yeah, it's possible USDC has changed their model. I haven't looked at how they actually issue their tokens in the last year or so. They might have added a treasury more like... Uh, oh, so you're saying that, that they realized the optics of doing a single big print were bad. I mean, I think the optics of doing a $6 billion print look bad because there's very few institutions or individuals who would be committing six billion dollars at once and so like the question then becomes why was it issued all at once right was there a bunch of stuff that cleared all at once uh, topar says they did not print six billion one go it was a it was a cmc error so yeah I think that's right. They didn't actually issue six billion once. They issued six billion over a couple of days, and Coin Market Cap pulls that information a little bit slower. But it was a very sudden and rapid expansion in USDC market cap. Uh, Coin Market Cap is an awful source in general, especially since they've been bought out by Binance. I don't understand why uh, Coin Market Cap. Why I don't like Coin Market Cap. They're bad, but that's largely unrelated. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, USDC is a strange coin to me because it is growing really fast and it's growing. Yeah, coin, I, I agree. Coin Gecko is a better place to use than uh, coin market cap. Um, yeah, but USDC has exploded recently and it's it's interesting to me to watch the dynamics. Um, True USD is another one of the stable coins that has just exploded recently. And True USD specifically is interesting to me because they exploded right after they stopped doing their attestations, right after they got bought out by an unknown conglomerate called Tecterix. And then even now their real-time attestation platform that they were using before is no longer available for them. In the meantime, they're adding billions in market cap. And there's just all this kind of strangeness and oddity surrounding a lot of these stable coins in the market. Uh, I think still Center or Circle or whoever owns USDC, and they did just release their March attestation. It's running them about uh, 50... I think they're up to like 50 days each for the attestations. And the wording in those attestations has shifted a little to where we've ended up with... Uh, a pretty broad approved investments category where it's not entirely clear what uh, USDC's reserves are in. I would say right now Paxos and GUSD, Gemini Dollar, are doing the best at being forthright about where their reserves are and what they're held in. Uh-oh. Yeah, the, the entire stablecoin marketplace is weird to me because like the general defense of Tether having their money and all these risky assets is that they need the yield in order to be running the business, right? But you're looking at a $60 billion market cap coin. Even if that was basically entirely in 10-year U.S. treasuries, you're going to start to, you're, they're going to be throwing off hundreds of millions of dollars in yield a year. It seems to me like stable coins should be something they can profitably, that, that should be a profitable business run legitimately, but it is, um, yeah, but again, we see these people not running it that way. Yeah, so... Uh, Tulpar was mentioning in the chat when I was mentioning that USDC changed their attestation a couple months here to say that now the uh, coins are in the custody accounts and in approved investments. It's not entirely clear what improved investments covers and the wording throughout the attestation is a little bit strange with the way they um, keep redefining dollars in custody basically in a couple of different places in the attestation. So it's curious to me what might be behind that. Um, yeah, uh, the other issue that often doesn't come up in the, these attestations and audits is, uh, money can be in an, in an account 
but not unencumbered. So for example, you could have several billion dollars in a bank account, but that money could be used to collateralize something else or otherwise be obligated to pay towards something else. And so that money is still in the account, in the account, but it's not unencumbered funds that are back in that coin. And so it is it is just important to remember that just in general when you're discussing stable coins and coins like these. Grant says, if Tether and USDC keep printing at the current rate, stable coins will likely be at least 10% of the total crypto market cap in three months. That seems like a lot of stable coins to me. Uh, but yeah, um, they're huge. These, these coins are a massive part of the market. And like Paxos through BUSD and Tether through USDT collateralize a bunch of futures on platforms like Binance. And so they're helping enable greater leverage across the system. And when these assets are deployed to DeFi, they're often deployed in a way that allows them to up up the overall leverage of the system, right? So you deposit your USDC in MakerDAO to get DAI, you use that DAI to buy more Ether, you deposit that Ether in MakerDAO to get more DAI, you use that DAI too, and you can keep cranking that up and you can shift between multiple protocols to maximize that effect. And so uh, even without stable coins growing to 10% of the total crypto market cap or whatever percent of the total crypto market cap because they still represent such this large part of both the liquidity and the leverage, it can end up having an effect significantly greater than the apparent size of the coins themselves. Which I just think is an important thing to remember when we're discussing the dynamics of these stable coins. Because when you're talking about a $2 trillion crypto market and you're looking at a $60 billion tether, it seems insignificant. It seems like no matter what happens to Tether, the crypto market should be safe. But this just returns to what is market cap. It's just the last clearing price times the number of uh, circulating units, right? And a dollar increase in market cap generally doesn't come from just a dollar increase in... A, a dollar coming in the system will have an outsized impact on market cap. And this effect can be magnified in illiquid and highly leveraged markets, which many of the crypto markets are going to look at look like. So, even at their current size, stablecoins pose a large risk to the value of many cryptocurrencies. And as Grant's pointing out, as they continue to grow, that risk doesn't get smaller, it gets significantly larger, right? Um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm just going to keep ranting. People don't have more questions. So, just in general. And so, I'm going to shift a little bit to MakerDAO and DAI related to these stablecoins. Um, because all of cryptocurrency, at least to me, its value comes from censorship resistance and resiliency. Basically, you are able to make payments and do things that people would otherwise want to stop you. And you can do it in difficult situations, in times when other systems might be impeded. DAI was supposed to be this way to issue issue a stable coin that avoided a lot of the centralizing risks of traditional stable coins because it was backed. It was over collateralized by these various assets and you could put them into these vaults and mint the die. At some point they decided they should start allowing people to issue die using other stable coins like USDC. Now, in order to enable this, the way MakerDAO decided to handle it was to create a special type of vault they call a USDCA vault. The USDCA vault differs from every other type of uh, MakerDAO vault in that it cannot be liquidated. No matter what the value of USDC is, that vault will continue to stay open. And so the protocol has no way to recover that funds. During the compound craze a little bit ago, when the yield on compound for DAI started to get really high, the die peg broke pretty hard, several cents above peg for an extended period of time. And to help compensate that, die just kept taking in more and more USDC and eventually more and more Tether and other of these centralized stable coins. The risk here is basically twofold to things like die, is that now you have a whole bunch of the value of your die collateralized by this token USDC that can be uh, frozen at any time by the central issuer, can lose value due to not having the reserves it's supposed to can be, uh, there can be regulator pressure on center and circle easily that would 
potentially change incentivize or destroy USDC, right? So you are basically introducing this multifaceted attack surface onto DAI. And then you're letting it grow to the point where now USDC is an existential risk to DAI itself. And DAI itself is an existential risk to a whole bunch of other protocols that are built up across the uh, DeFi system. And so you end up in a situation where this group of people who are allegedly building this system that's meant to be censorship resistant, meant to be resilient, and meant to be able to stand up to a state level actor assault is designed with this massive attack surface that basically invites an attack from the entity you are claiming to want to supersede. It is just shocking to me to see that kind of structure start to prevail across cryptocurrency as a whole. It seems antithetical to the stated ideals of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Um, Eric Penner asked me if I was surprised to see Coinbase add USDC. Are they trying to add legitimacy? I, for one, am surprised they are playing dirty. So I actually wrote an article about this where I talked about why I thought it made sense for Coinbase to list Tether. And it comes down to a couple of things. First, people seem to too often assume that Coinbase has some special purity in the industry, that them listing Tether as a form of uh, anointment. And I think that's inconsistent with Coinbase's own history in the space. I mean, they recently had to settle with the CFTC because one of their pairs was 99% wash trading. Coinbase isn't a universally gen good actor and have had um, lots of issues in the past around insider trading and other accusations like that. Now, why do I think Coinbase listed Tether? A couple of different reasons. First and foremost, they're not saying Tether's okay. They're letting people deposit it and they're letting people trade it. The entire time they're collecting their fees and their fees are generally relatively high in this industry. So they're making money immediately from Tether being listed, right? Besides that, there is a USDT, USDC pair. So if there's any issues with Tether, it immediately makes their competitor to Tether look significantly better. USDC now looks more stable, stronger, and better, better than Tether. That is going to be important for Coinbase going forward. The other reason I wrote about was that uh, it provides Coinbase with some useful market intelligence in that Tether... Coinbase now knows a whole bunch of U.S. and worldwide entities who um, have the who had tethers, who deposit tethers, and who withdraw tethers. Knowing who those institutions are, knowing who those people are, allows them to figure out how to better target their products and stuff towards Coinbase or towards uh, tether users. The other thing that I didn't talk about in the article, but I did talk about on a podcast called When the Music Stops with Aviv Milner a couple days ago, was that Coinbase recognizes that DeFi is a big part of the crypto market at this place. And they've shown that they want to build out their own Coinbase wallet. As part of doing this, since Tether is an important DeFi asset, they probably realized they were going to need to have a way to handle Tether inside that wallet. My intuition is as part of the, that build out, they realized it would be reasonably easy to list it, thought about some of the other things I listed and decided to list it. Um, let's see. Uh, B. Siler asked me, what are my thoughts on Monero? Um, I like Monero. I'm not making a value judgment that like I'm not suggesting its value is going to go up or down, but I think there is value in having private currency and having currency that can't be easily tracked or anything like that. And Monero seems to be one of the better ones at doing that. There have been some academic attempts to try to deobfuscate the Monero network and they're moderately successful, but I still think you're looking at a pretty solid privacy solution there. And I think there is value in having money that can be transacted privately. We're returning back to my, the thing that gives cryptocurrency value is censorship resistant. And privacy can be an important part of censorship resistance by helping making it uh, less risky to make the transaction in the first place. Um, Tucker Preston mentions that the Tether Terms of Service allows them to basically at any time unilaterally change their fees because right now they are uh, relatively low. 
10 basis points in and out. Um, plus, I think there's a new account fee or something. Yeah, so, and he asked if they could use that to gate if people started trying to withdraw and they needed to slow that down. I think they certainly could. I think, so my intuition is that there are, are a small number of institutions who regularly redeem tethers and that many of these institutions are, if tether tells them it'll be best if you wait a couple days, they're likely going to wait a couple days. This is conjecture on my part, but it seems consistent with the way I have seen uh, the cryptocurrency ecosystem as a whole work. Anybody else have any parting questions? Well, thank you all for joining me. I enjoyed answering a few more questions about Tether and Bitfinex. Uh, the video will probably stay up on my channel after this for anyone who wants to share it or rewatch it or anything. Um, thanks for joining me and have a good night.